everyone. My name is Troy Lamel Stovall, and I'm here with another session of TEDCO Talks. And today I am extremely excited uh, to bring um, uh, someone who's become a counselor to me, a friend, a partner, and frankly, kind of one of my bosses too, because she sits on our board, um, Secretary Kelly Schultz. Kelly, thank you for agreeing to do this. I really appreciate you and I appreciate all you do for the state and for TEDCO. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Oh, I am so pleased to be here. I appreciate the invitation and talk good things about economic development moving forward. Thank you. Absolutely. Troy. Absolutely. Why don't, why don't we start with, with some little fun? Well, first of all, just tell us a little bit about just Kelly. Who, who's Kelly and how Kelly got to this point in her career? Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> That's the toughest question of all. I can talk a lot about the Department of Commerce. I, I'm <laughs> not going to talk, talking about Kelly, but uh, thank you. Uh, I served, uh, I, I've had a wonderful almost two years at the Department of Commerce and have a phenomenal team uh, building economic development across the state. Prior to coming to the Department of Commerce, I was the Secretary of Labor in Maryland for four years, uh, which has been hugely beneficial coming into um, the economic development role because, as I always said at the Department of Labor, you can't have economic development without workforce development. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm at the Department of Commerce, I say you can't have uh, workforce development without economic development. So uh, really trying to increase those uh, collaborations and opportunities um, amongst all the agencies and the subject matter experts to be able to make sure that we're working together moving forward. And I will say also, um, prior to going to the Department of Labor and joining the executive branch, I, I was an elected official. Um, uh, and I represented Frederick County in the um, in the House of Delegates for four plus years, and that was um, an extreme privilege and a wonderful opportunity in order to be able to understand constituent services at that level. Outstanding. Again, like I said before, just thank you for your service to the state uh, and obviously to TEDCO. And so, why don't you let folks understand a little bit, go deeper into commerce, so folks understand the role that commerce plays in in writ large, but if you could focus a little bit about, uh, given this is a TEDCO conversation, about entrepreneurship and the role that commerce is playing with entrepreneurship. Sure. So I'll just, you know, state, you know, very generally the mission of the Department of Commerce. Our, co our mission is to be able to grow, um, expand, um, retain, and attract new jobs to the state of Maryland in any capacity. And we have key industry sectors that we work with. Um, and those are very clearly identified, and we have the Maryland Economic Development Commission that helps us to identify those sectors. And how it relates to TEDCO is that, you know, several of those sectors have very much to do with high, uh, highly technical types of industries, um, biotechnology, cybersecurity, life sciences in general, um, other very technical types of um, occupations and industries, uh, advanced manufacturing. Right, so there's, there's a broad spectrum of, of industries that we do target, and there are strategic targets for them. The Department of Commerce is focused on, as opposed to TEDCO, and this is kind of the differences between the two entities, we are focused on expansion of jobs, as opposed to investment in industry-specific um, entities. And so the job creation is something that's um, very, um, I, I would say specific to many of our, or if not most of our programs that we have, our research and development tax credits. We also have um, a um, very specific charter in order to be able to include small minority and women-owned businesses within our um, structure in our, in our program. So we have very specific programs that are um, detailed around their entities and their LLCs that they have promoted as well. Um, there's been a recent focus on some very specific industries when it comes to distribution and logistics based mm -hmm. on uh, what our assets are and our core capabilities in the state. Um, when it comes to very specific industries that are centered around the port, which has some of the highest numbers of any port in the nation, um, and also the I-95 and the um, I-70 corridor comes to the distribution and logistics aspects of that. So we take all of that into um, 
account when we when we look at what what we do um, as far as attracting different types of businesses specifically focused on if we can those types of headquarters that can come here to bring the higher paying jobs um, in those areas that might need those higher paying jobs and being able to add more revenue and capital investments in um, sometimes in rural areas that may need that. Um, I, will, I will just say the last focus or the second to last focus would be on international development mm -hmm. and working very specifically with our Maryland businesses to be able to expand on their ability to be able to work with global entities on exporting because it's very important for them to be able to advance their revenue dollars on the, their export dollars and what they can do with those trades um, across the continents. And then the other part is on our tourism and our arts industry. And some people don't necessarily realize that commerce is as involved, but the, um, the, the tourism division, the Office of Tourism and, um, and Film is located within the Department of Commerce, as well as the Maryland State Arts Council. And there's about $18 billion of state revenue that comes from the tourism industry in general. So um, you would imagine that right now the Department of Commerce is very heavily invested on being able to make sure that we continue to improve the environment for those tourism industry groups that, that are out there right now, especially during the pandemic, during COVID. Absolutely. And you, you, you kind of, I think, probably answered the question I was about to ask is, you know, because of that huge breadth there that's a commerce, what would be an area that the people might, may not recognize or realize as part of, of commerce? And I would assume the answer probably is tourism and, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the film. It, I think it would be. I, I think people, when they think of economic development overall, they don't necessarily think of tourism and the arts as being a part of economic development, but, but it really is because when we talk about the quality of life, that's really very important for a couple of reasons, right? So it's important to be able to make sure that people know that when they move to the state of Maryland or they want to talk about expanding their operations in Maryland, that the quality of life for those employees, for those families that are that are coming to Maryland, have the opportunity to um, do all of the things, whether it be educational, whether it be outdoor activities. Um, there's a wide array of things that they look at when they want to be able to approve a site for their um, larger types of headquarters. But also the economic impact in general for some of those outdoor recreation activities and those mm -hmm. tourism um, activities People don't um, automatically see that as a top economic priority, but for the state of Maryland, it is. We have everything from the beaches on, on the eastern shore to the mountains in <laughs> western Maryland and everything in between. We've been expanding our rail trails and um, our hiking opportunities and all of the outdoor activities as much as we possibly can. And there's a national um, organization that Maryland has joined in order to be able to accentuate that. And um, I think that it has multiple uh, returns on our, our, on our investment that we're going to be able to see in the future. No, that's, that's great, because you're right. I mean, it's, you know, talent, and you know, I've had a little bit of this conversation, talent is attracted not just because of the opportunity from the job, but because it's, it makes a sense for their family and for their ability to, to grow their family. And then that becomes kind of the, the, the grease in the wheel, if you will. If, if that type of talent is attracted to that space, then others who, who see that will also want to come to, to, to Maryland for, that, for those exact reasons. You're, you're absolutely right. And so any business that, that is starting to work with a consultant uh, on you know, site selection, they'll come to the state of Maryland and they'll ask you know, us what our resources are. You know, yeah. What are those assets that we have that can be helpful um, to be able to steer their C-suite folks that are making those decisions so that we can make sure that they have the understanding that Maryland is the place to be in order for them to set their place at home here. So switching gears a little bit, you know, I'll bring, you already brought it up, the, the five letter word, uh, uh, you know, the five letter word called COVID. Um, and um, a lot of places to go with this, but let, let me start with just Kelly and, and your leadership. Because one of the things I've been trying to have a conversation with folks about is how has Kelly's leadership and what you do, and obviously what commerce does, how did that get shifted, you know, come when you went from February to March? I'm sure when you, at the beginning of 2020, Kelly had a plan and you, you kind of had some clarity and then March hits and those plans got thrown out the door. So, so the question really is, first of all, did, how did Kelly shift how Kelly thought about managing 
uh, leadership? If that's the question, how do you manage in this environment? And then the second question is, what's, how is commerce beginning to respond to, to COVID? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story. It was on uh, March 13th when, you know, we were all in the office at the World Trade Center in, in Baltimore at the Inner Harbor with my team. And uh, we had the, the possibility that there was going to um, be somewhat of a shutdown for state mm -hmm. employees on, on the next day and uh, from the governor's office. And so we were starting to prepare and I was pulling my, my leadership team together. And I said, all right, folks, so um, we're going to go home for a few weeks, probably, <laughs> right? And make sure that we don't want anybody to be bored. We want to be able to make sure that, you know, we fill our time and all of our team's time with things like, you know, uh, recreating standard operating procedures and uh, doing those administrative functions that we might not have the ability to do because the last thing we want is for anybody to be bored. <laughs> and so we all took home stacks of work. I think I actually might still have my stack of work that's here that I brought home in March with me um, as, you know, that follow-up work to be done. Um, we never got around to that. Um, actually, we, we probably are getting around to that right now. But um, about a week later, the governor charged us with a very important mission, and that was in order to be able to distribute um, business relief grants and loans okay. to the business community and to set up uh, brand new programs that had not been set up before. And everybody at the Department of Commerce um, switched gears from attracting new businesses to just being able to help businesses to sustain themselves. Yep. And that was a huge shift. So overall, the mission of uh, being business friendly and wanting to be able to have that relationship with the business was still there. The implementation of our service to those businesses shifted dramatically um, over the course of the economic um, crisis. And um, it was everything from um, distributing the grants and being able to uh, build an airplane while we were in flight, I like to say when um, we did not have a database, a distribution system, a management system for 30,000 applications that came to us almost immediately. There, there was not the infrastructure for that. So we did that on the fly. Um, and then also uh, bringing in industry groups, uh, 13 um, advisory groups uh, for, for specific industries in order to be able to discuss with them what the possibility of not only the shutdown, but also the recovery looked like. And so we became that main focal point in order to be able to do that. So the good news is that now we have distributed almost $200 million out to the business community um, in grants and loans. Um, we have satisfied those applications that have come to us from all of the grant applications. It was almost 20,000 that had come into us um, through several different rounds of funding that the governor has authorized. And I would say as equally as important as the financial aspects have been, I would say the, um, the, the ability to act as um, the first responder, the, the, the people that were there mm -hmm. right for the businesses. We have mm -hmm. our regional um, directors, our regional personnel that are out there on the streets every day and being able to have advocacy from the Department of Commerce in every corner of the state of Maryland to provide assistance and guidance and mentorship to those businesses that were having trouble. Um, I would think that that was it, it, as equally as important as the financial um, mm -hmm. offer that we've had. And how about Kelly? How have you, you know, how have you personally and professionally kind of navigated these last, what, eight, nine months? Well, I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you for so, that. <laughs> you know, it has been, I would say, one of the most professionally challenging and gratifying opportunities that I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And I, I am completely 100% humbled by the team that works with me on an everyday basis. I have been a witness of some of the most extraordinary talents and skills coming out of our team that I don't think 
we ever would have known existed unless COVID happened, right? Wow. Wow. Um, and, and, and there's extraordinary stories of people that have done just really amazing things within the department, the late nights and um, the conversations with, with businesses who are extremely troubled and being able to just, just really work with them in order to be able to come up with positive results. And so as a, as a leader, I am the most proud of the team that has gone way above and beyond what their calling is and what their duties have been over the course of the last nine months. And then I will say personally, um, I've gotten to know, and, and Troy, you may um, kind of um, appreciate this, I have gotten to know my team more mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. now than I did when I was on the road every single day and just kind of catching people on the fly. And I feel as if I've been actually able to participate in some of the solutions and the opportunities that they're creating as opposed to just an innocent bystander, if no, that I, makes any sense. I think it does. It's all because I a lot of following them, but I, you're right. And I do sense that, you know, I'm new to TEDCO, but I, you know, I came from an environment we, we were dealing with it. And you're right. I think um, for me, I have tried to open myself up even more, right? And so, it, you know, kind of be more vulnerable for myself so that others can be vulnerable with me. And I think in that vulnerability, we actually gain strength. Um, and you're right. And so you you, cause you, and you see people because you see them now in their homes and you see them when the kids are running around in the background or, you know, something, you, you, you get a sense into their personal lives and there's a sharing that happens because we're now in everybody's homes, right? I mean, you're, I'm sitting here looking in your home and you're looking, you don't see my home, but you're in my home. And, and so there is, um, there's a depth, I think, to your point, I think you're making that we, we now have with, our, with the folks that we work with that actually makes it better and easier for us to tackle some tougher situations. Right, and you know, so I, I, I totally appreciate that and you're absolutely correct. And, um, and it makes you much more aware of the constraints that some of your team has mm -hmm. when it comes to you know, performing their job. It's not about, um, in our case, you know, somebody being able to get to the World Trade Center uh, by eight o'clock in the morning on Monday. It's about whether or not that same individual has the ability to uh, log into work while they're trying to log their children into virtual education um, and trying to make sure that everything is taken care of on, on the home front yep. because we are almost 100% teleworking at the Department of Commerce. And so what we have done is um, I have advised my team that to block off on their calendars, you know, I mean, as a state employee, there's an expectation that you work your eight hours as a state employee. I can guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of my team works more than eight hours at the right. Department of Commerce. But you need to block off that time in the Spread middle forward. of the day and yeah. or at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day so that I don't lose track of where you are in your personal life um, and schedule a meeting that you feel obligated to attend, but you also have to get your kids linked up with their school and, or you have to take care of an elderly family member, or you have to deal with something personally. And, and I think that's where going into the, you know, to the teleworking future and the Zoom world is, is going to be most important is to be able to make sure that people set their boundaries because mm -hmm. I want my team to be as, uh, as uh, functional and as, you know, extraordinary as they possibly can, but they can't do it without making sure that the rest of their life is in order. Well, when, when, when people hear this, I really hope they, they highlight what you just said. And I mean it sincerely, Kelly, because I think you're right, the notion of boundaries and because I see if you agree, I, I don't think we're going to go back for most of us to the five day in the office model. I think there's going to be, you know, some give and take on that and, and how that plays out in different industries and different areas of, of, of a, the economy. And so we've got to learn to manage with people that may not be physically in the office five days a week. Uh, and I think your point on boundaries and, and being able to set that aside and recognizing that is going to be make us all better people 
and at the end of the day, better managers. So, I agree. So, um, so let's talk a little bit since you know we're still down on this this co this COVID path. I'd, I'd love to know if you can share. Uh, you could say you gave out two hundred million dollars in grants and loans. It'd be great for the folks to hear kind of a specific story if you can share and how specific you can be. You can at least be that really shows how this really helped a business in Maryland. You know, kind of survive through this thing. Yeah, so um, we've heard, we've had some great success stories that we've heard back from, thank goodness, because as you might know, our team at Commerce, traditionally, we're the good news people, right? I mean, we're out there, we're talking about economic development, and we're talking about all good things. And um, during this crisis, we've had um, our team respond to some, you know, of those disaster calls right? Those, those businesses that are not able to make it and those that are in um, very high levels of frustration and um, different degrees of failure at this mm -hmm. point in time. And that's, that's hard for our team to internalize. Um, so when we get the responses back um, from grantees um, or those that are receiving the loans, it's, it's like a celebration at the Department of Commerce, right? And so there's thousands and thousands of businesses that we've been able to provide funding at the state level for. This is above and beyond what the federal government may have provided. Right. But being able to assist them in their overhead costs or being able to make sure that they can uh, keep people employed as opposed to putting them on unemployment insurance, which is you know, detrimental to both the business and the employee at that point in time, in right. most cases. Um, it, it has been um, very satisfying to see some of the ways in which the businesses have been able to utilize those grants. And I will say some of the best ways that we've been able to see people utilize the grants is to be able to increase their technology, right? To be able to understand that um, if you're a business and you wanna do something differently, um, that is related to or being able to help to emphasize your role in the new type of economy that we're sure to get in, you know, going forward from now, then that's really inspiring. And those businesses that have been able to use technology in order to be able to alter their existing business plans um, and the way that they do business, um, that has been very satisfying, I think, to us. Awesome. And um, one of the best ways that I can, I can mention for that is we had a, a minimal, I mean, in the general scope of things, $5 million that went to a manufacturing innovation grant at the very beginning um, in March that went out there. And we received a couple hundred applications that came in um, talking about how manu existing manufacturers uh, could innovate their existing technology in order to be able to produce PPP uh, mm -hmm. for the crisis, for the healthcare, for the frontline workers, uh, for those critical needs items that were out there. And for us to be able to distribute it, I think it was up to $100,000 to those manufacturers if they had a, an equipment or a technological fix that needed to happen or a training uh, that needed to be happened for their employees. That was a, that was a double win. Right, we were able to satisfy that critical needs list with real Maryland made products, but we were also able to supplement the manufacturers with additional work during a time where others were not able to work. That sounds good. And I think that was a very innovative approach in order to be able to develop that. And no, so those are, there, there are many success stories yeah, yeah, yeah. out there that talk about that. Well, again, thank you and Commerce for keeping, for keeping and doing what you could to kind of help us through this. So we're, we're, we're now looking at, you know, some vaccines, you know, we're hoping that these vaccines, you know, really do begin to make a difference. And so as, as Kelly, as Secretary Schultz, and as, as the Commerce begins to think about how we come out of this and, and you know, how do we really stay Maryland strong to the governor's you know, to plan? What do you, do you see any pivots that commerce needs to make in order to see us out of uh, the economic hit that COVID has brought to us? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty broad question. Um, I would say that Maryland is several steps ahead. I was just talking about COVID and vaccines in general. Uh, we have several 
companies in the state that have been very significant to uh, the development of a vaccine, uh, whether they are the primary developer or they are um, a supplier to the developer. And um, I believe it's over $6 billion mm -hmm. that has been expended in the state um, by um, Operation Warp Speed. Warp speed. Yep. Um, and so, and we're very proud of that and we're, we're gonna move forward. Uh, the governor, uh, governor and I attended um, the announcement at Novavax after they had received their funding um, in Montgomery County and e extremely proud of all of the advancements that we are able to make when it comes to life sciences. So, um, and we'll talk about it possibly in a little bit, Troy, but, you know, emphasizing the, um, the ecosystem that we have here in the state of Maryland that doesn't just exist of the Novavax environment or the AstraZeneca environment or you know the the Lidos environment. Like, what are the other supply chain? Right, what is the other smaller businesses that are yeah. going to be able to work with in order to be able to make that whole entire program a success? So that's what we're focused on at the Department of Commerce when it comes to you know that industry specifically and to be able to make sure that there's a success with that. It, and, and quite frankly, uh, that's where TEDCO comes in because it's not just the Department of Commerce, right? I mean, the Department of Commerce doesn't do investments in companies, um, in small businesses, and in startups. We help to provide the ecosystem, the marketing, the growth and the expansion of those startup companies. Um, but TEDCO has the portfolio in order to be able to invest in those companies to be able to make them successful and go into different rounds of funding. Um, commerce needs to be a partner with that as they continue to grow, as they continue to um, have additional jobs and create different capital expenditures in their um, localities. And to know that they have different incentives and tax credit programs in the mm -hmm. state in order to be able to make them welcome. And that's why we're here. No, no, absolutely, and I appreciate you doing that, to Tedco. But you're right. I was having, I've had several conversations, not only explicit with you, but being more explicit about the notion of the capital stack that these companies need to have, and that those capital stacks include loans and credits, non-dilutive capital, investment no income, and and so and and making and and providing uh, programs that help entrepreneurs, particularly startup ones, understand that it's not all one type of, of, of access to capital that's going to get them there. And as you know, there's just, there's, there's a level of, of maturity that not everyone has of understanding all those different types of capital. And so having partnerships with you and, and other parts of other organizations, you know, we got the EcoMap project as an example, so people can know about the, the, the plethora of resources that, that the Maryland has. So on that, um, let's talk about, you use the word ecosystem. How, in your mind has, how has COVID helped or hurt uh, this innovation ecosystem that, we're, that we are building and are, and are moving towards in Maryland? Well, it's hard, it's hard to, you know, really uh, say out loud that COVID has helped us at all. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop short of that. Um, I will say that it has highlighted some um, opportunities for us to take advantage of, right? So, um, I, I will say Maryland in general for the last several years has really um, worked to push ourselves as a leader of the in, in life sciences mm -hmm. um, to include biotechnology and that's the whole expanse of, of where we are. And it had always been a focus and Maryland has really for the last six years since I have been a part of the executive branch anyway, um, really pushed to be able to try to put our stake in the ground that we are a leader in these efforts. COVID, uh, where we have been since March or possibly even before, um, has placed us in a position to get the national recognition, I believe that we should have and could have had prior to that. And so Maryland at this point in time has every opportunity to be able to, you know, scream from the rooftops about all of these resources and assets that we do have. We have more federal laboratories in the state of Maryland than Absolutely. any other state. 
Yep. We have more PhDs in the state of Maryland than any other state. We graduate more people in STEM occupations than any other state, right? So we, we need to be able to capitalize on that right now. And if we don't do it right now in the next year, then we have lost the best opportunity that the state of Maryland has ever had in order to be able to say that we are the number one leader. We're not the number two, we're not the number three, but we have all of this in place in order to be able to make ourselves the most successful that we can be and um, to make Maryland, to put Maryland officially on the map as the leader in the life sciences. It. No, um, I love industry. it. I love your sense of urgency and I love your sense of action. That's, that's what's got to happen, right? We've got to take advantage of what's been given to us because it's not going to stay there forever uh, and how you do that. But as, as we do that, Kelly, um, how do we make sure that all Marylanders are, are a part of that, right? You know, and so this, the question is around diversity and inclusion, you know, and, and for me, I think, you know, had, you know, diversity and inclusion isn't just about the traditional gender and race, uh, but it's got to also include the socioeconomic difference, difference that, that exists in the state as well. So as commerce, as we, as we move our way through this and some of the programs that commerce has, what are some of the efforts that you're looking to do to try to in, make more Marylanders be included in this recovery? Yeah, I think they have to, right? I mean, so it's not just the Department of Commerce. It, I, I will say it's the Department of Labor. And having coming from the Department of Labor, I understand how much their, in, um, their programs are really designated around that inclusive, um, diversified type of, types of opportunities. Um, so the Department of Commerce is one thing when it comes to that workforce and placemaking, I guess, in, in general. Mm -hmm. But I will say also, uh, with the Department of Labor's work in being able to get those immediately trained into types of industries and professions. And that comes down to, and I'll just, I'll put on my workforce labor hat for a second, that that comes down to, you know, instant certifications. Yep. And um, outside of, you know, sitting on the, the TEDCO board of directors, um, and serving as the Secretary of Commerce, I also sit as a member of the University System of Maryland's Board of Regents. And it comes down to the fact that higher education has to be able to adjust quickly. And they've heard me say this, so I'm not saying anything on turn. They need to be able to adjust quickly to the types of jobs that are out there and the types of needs and those entry level positions that may be able to be satisfied by something other than a four-year degree, or even in some cases, a two-year um, degree, right? There are certifications and different types of training opportunities that are available in order to be able to give people the opportunity to enter an industry at a specific level without having it be a very long-term project. And I like to say it's about a lifetime worth of learning as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, a four year, you know, get the degree and get out and then you're no, not learning anymore. There is a lifetime of learning opportunities that are out there. You have to get inside the industry at those entry levels in order to be able to make that happen. Well, let me just say amen, sister, um, on that. I, um, as you know, I came from higher ed and I've been preaching the same thing uh, that, that particularly in the tech space and particularly in the technology space, there are jobs that are available that just require badging or certifications. And to your point, you can always have a pathway as you choose as an individual to go and secure that degree, but at least get you something that gets you a job, lets you take care of your family, and then you on your own time and your own volition can go and get that degree if that makes sense for you and your career. Uh, but the, as, you, as you aptly said, the higher ed model, particularly the four-year one, is frankly built on that economic model. And it's gonna be a hard, hard pivot for them. We could have a whole separate conversation on how hard that's going to be. And, and, maybe, and maybe we can, Troy, because I'm, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the, the earn as you learn, right? That apprenticeship model. And I've been talking about it for six years and pushing really hard at all different levels in the traditional and non-traditional types of occupations. But you, know, you can be in cybersecurity, you can be in healthcare, you can be in life sciences and have an apprenticeship type program that's going to allow you the opportunity to continue to learn your profession while you're earning a paycheck mm -hmm. and with no debt whatsoever when it comes to, you know, the cost of higher education. So I, I think that I, I think that that is the promise of the future, quite that frankly. Is, and to, to the, 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 I guess the individual child, the question, it does provide opportunities for socioeconomic groups and, 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 and other 
folks that would but, but for be able to get into spaces like life sciences. I mean, there aren't a lot of, let's be blunt, blacks and people of color in the life sciences spaces. And because of the, to your point, the long uh, educational track that it takes to get you know, that knowledge base in those spaces. So Exactly. So look, so I, that, I agree 100%. Let me, um, let me uh, close with, with a little bit of fun. Um, I want to just say a couple of words and we're going to do a little word association. And first thing that comes to mind. Oh, yeah. I get look at that and then exhale. <laughs> so you'll see, you'll, you'll hopefully be fun. So we'll start with some easy ones. Chesapeake. Uh, Chesapeake. Uh, summer fun. There you go. Crabs. Big economic advance. <laughs> I can see what you're mine. <laughs> Here's one for you, Annapolis. Politics. <laughs> uh, Hood College. My home. <laughs> I thought you liked that one. <laughs> COVID. Underestimated. Wow, I like that. That's a great one, Kelly. Tedco. Partner. Commerce. Team. Very good. Kelly Schultz, thank you. I appreciate you. Appreciate your time. Any last words you want to say to our audience? Well, I, I want to thank the audience for if they've gotten to this point of the interview. Thank you very much for, for sticking around. Uh, feel free to email us at any time at Commerce for any additional information. But Troy, to, to your and your team at TEDCO, um, it's been an amazing several months. You came into this organization at a very interesting time. Um, and so I appreciate your partnership and your stewardship um, to the programs that we put forward. And I look forward to many years of, of growth within the state because I am, I am an optimist and I know that we're going to come up on top. Amen. So thank you, Kelly. Again, thank you. Again, this is Troy Lamel Stovall with Teddy Co Talks. Thanks, everybody, and see you next time.